last time we met, which was last Thursday, I introduced topics of chemical foundations. And, uh, well, that included things like, uh, let's see. Like, uh, what is our current understanding of what an atom is, what an element is? And then we, we looked at, uh, Making compounds, right? how to write a compound. Uh, today, we're going to expand upon that and look at how we name compounds. And it, it's not a small, it's not a small subject. Um, there are rules that must be obeyed in order for, for the compound to be named correctly and for others to understand what you mean when you say sodium chloride. <clears throat> there are, um, I think in this chapter, we have a couple of extra credits available. Um, um, yeah. So this is one of them. This is uh, getting to know your periodic table, right? I may have, I've probably shown you this before, but it's got a blank periodic table on one side, on one page, and the other page gives you the rules for how to fill it out. Now, the not so smart student will just regurgitate and just fill it in and not try to learn anything from it. Likewise, this extra credit uh, is naming compounds. So the uh, the document itself has on has some rules up here that'll help you out, and then you have either names or compound formulas here. And if you have a formula, you name it. If you have a name, you write the compound uh, sim symbolically, and that you do on the next page. Here, but there are 50 of them. Uh, and um, if there happen to be some polyatomic ions that are involved, there's a whole list of them here. And there's one other rule that I'm going to, I'm going to cover in the lecture today. So I'm not going to bother with it right now about naming compounds. It's, it's the last topic I believe that I cover in this chapter. All right, so let's let's start talking about how to name compounds. Nomenclature is like any other language. If you don't know the rules and you don't use the rules when you speak your language, no one else will understand what you're saying. Or, uh, there are multiple examples in any culture that claims to have a single language. They call them dialects. So you go from one region to another and the dialect of the language changes. Sometimes it changes so much that you can't understand your own language spoken by those people. We can't afford that in chemistry. We have to be able to name compounds and from the name, write the symbolic uh, structure, uh, not the structure, the symbolic um, uh, formulas for the compounds. If you can't do that, then you can't go any further. It's like I said uh, earlier, if you don't know the alphabet, the symbols for the uh, elements, then you're stuck. You can't go any further. Uh, here's another roadblock. If you can't name a compound, then you're stuck. You can't go any further in, in chemistry. So these are essential skills that you must master. All right.
So we're going to start off, uh, by the way, these rules that didn't just form out of thin air. The rules uh, were are proposed by a committee of uh, this oversight group called IUPAC. That's the International Union for Pure and Applied Chemists. And they have a subcommittee that deals with nothing but nomenclature. And that, sub, that uh, committee probably has sub-subcommittees that deal with various types of nomenclature for inorganic chemistry, for um, um, organic chemistry, and even branches of organic chemistry. So they have specialties. And nomenclature is something that in chemistry you live with for the rest of your life. And you're continually learning. But you got to start somewhere. And we're going to start with binary compounds. What's a binary compound? A binary compound is one that's composed of only two components. Typically, we think of the binary compound as two elements, but it doesn't have to be just two elements. And I'll explain that as we proceed. We're going to start with just two elements. So a binary compound in the beginning is two elements. Now, the compound can either be ionic. Right? In order for a compound to be ionic, one member has to transfer electrons to the other member completely. So remember what we discussed in the, in the last chapter. If we say that's neutral sodium and it has 11 protons, correct? If it transfers an electron someplace else, now it's deficient in one electron. That means this produces a sodium ion. Okay? So in order to be an ionic compound, this cation, a positive ion, must be paired with an anion. It can be anything with a negative charge. It could be one, uh, neg one negative charge, two, three, it doesn't matter. We're just going to use one. So if we take this chlorine atom with 17 protons and 17 electrons, we add an electron to it, remember? Now it becomes excess in one negative. And that means the anion now is that uh, chlorine ion. That forms a binary ionic compound. Notice one other characteristic about binary ionic compounds. That's a metal. That's a non-metal. That's always the case. Ionic compounds only form between metals and non-metals. So knowing your periodic table and where to find the metals and where to find the non-metals is an important skill. You can also form binary compounds between two nonmetals. And when you do that, they, they don't transfer electrons completely from one to the other. They actually share electrons. That was, that's what we mean by covalent. Covalent means sharing electrons. And all you need is, well, you need more than that, but you can... These compounds always form between two nonmetals. So the, the best example I can think of is uh, water. Right? With water, you have two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Well, hydrogen, hydrogen can act like a metal, it can act like a nonmetal. So that's a bad example. Let me try something else. How about uh, ah, carbon dioxide? Now you have a non-metal and a non-metal, a carbon and oxygen. They're both non-metals. This is where they come from in the periodic table. Sodium, in our example, comes from the left-hand side, chlorine from the left right-hand side. Okay. Now, I'm going to explain what type 1 compound means and type 2 and type 3 compounds in just a minute. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. All right. 
That's just there for the recording. Uh, before I get to the rules for naming compounds, I want to emphasize this point. There are some elements in the periodic table that when they form ionic compounds, they always produce uh, a definite single charge for the ion. No other possibilities. The best way to, to find those is look at the periodic table. And I'll go back. Let me go back. Here we go. This first group right here, the alkali metals, they always form always form plus one charge. The second group, right next door, alkaline earths, or alkaline earth metals. They always form a two plus charge. All right? Then we skip over this, this group here called the transition metals, and we go to this group right here. It starts with boron. It doesn't have a special name, so we just say the boron group. Which includes boron, aluminum, gallium, and indium. These always form a plus three charge. All right. Now, there are a few in the transition metals that only form a single charge. Um, one of them is silver. And these are individual examples. Silver always forms, well, I can do better than that. Silver always forms a single plus charge. And let me see, let me check myself. I don't want to tell you something that's not true. Yeah. Um, zinc is always a two plus charge and cadmium is always a two plus charge. So those metals are fixed charges. It's important to know those fixed charges because they contribute to type one compound naming. And I'll, I'll mention that again in just a minute. Type two compound naming, um, the metal can, uh, can uh, assume two or more different charges depending on its association with the anion. Right, so we'll go to the, we'll get to that in a minute. But these are examples of single charge ions. The hydrogen's at the top, and hydrogen usually forms a plus. One plus. However, hydrogen can act like the second partner can be an anion if the first partner is a metal. Okay. So I'll cover that later. Just uh, just to mention that fact. All right, so here we have another example, aluminum, right? Aluminum is from the boron group. It's always a plus three charge. So when you write the compound, aluminum and chlorine, if aluminum is going to be a three plus charge and chlorine is gonna only have one minus charge, how do we keep that compound neutral? Balance the charges. If this is a three plus, and that's only one minus, you're gonna need three of them. Three times one minus is three minus, balances a three plus. It's very simple, balance the charges. All right. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the rules in a very ordered fashion, a way that you can use to decide how to name a compound, binary compound, right? 
type one compounds. Like we said before, these are always between a metal and a non-metal. Metal and a non-metal. The metal has a fixed charge. Right? And I showed you where to find those. There's only one possibility, a fixed charge. So when we name the compound, we always name the cation first. And we don't invent some new name for the ion. We just name the element. We'll use this one that we just talked about, right? aluminum, right? The anion, we do change. We change the ending to an IDE. So chlorine becomes chloride. So aluminum chloride is that compound. If we have this name, we can write this compound. There, there are two overriding rules for naming compounds. One is that the name cannot be ambiguous. That means when you say this name, there's no possibility that you could write more than one formula. Or well, this formula can only be named that way. It's unambiguous. And the other rule is it's not redundant. That is, you don't put any information in the name or in the formula that is already there. You don't add any extra information that's not already uh, available in the formula. Right? We know since this aluminum comes is is paired with three chlorides that it has to be a plus three charge and we know also that aluminum is a plus three charge anyway when it's an ion and when you write aluminum chloride you don't have to say what the charge is we know aluminum is always a three plus and chlorides are always minus one because it's a halogen i didn't mention that earlier let me let me uh let me go back and fill in the blanks here. Uh, we mentioned, here we go, anions. Anions typically have, uh, some of them have fixed charges. So if we go back to the periodic table, right, this group right here, of course, on the far right are the noble gases. They don't have a charge. So you don't have to worry about those. The next group, the halogens, the halogens always have minus one charge. When they're associated with a metal, when they're in an ionic compound, that's important distinction. They have to be in an ionic compound, then they're a minus one charge. Next door to the chlorines, this group, are the calcogens, the oxygen group. They're always minus two. Next to them, in this uh, one, minus one, minus two, next group over here, these are the nictogens. The nitrogen group. When they're in ionic compounds, they're always minus three. Okay? That's as far as we can go. If we go any further to the left, we hit the carbon group. And the carbon group, they swing both ways, right? So they don't have definite charges. All right, so let me get back to the type types of compounds. All right, we were talking about uh, type one compound, All right? This is, these two rules are active for all types of naming. The name cannot be ambiguous and it must not be redundant. Okay. Type two compound.
type two compounds are still metal and non-metal. See, are they on the, oh, we have examples here. More examples of binaries. All right, so there's K. If you don't know that K is potassium, you can't name this compound. Potassium chloride. Potassium is an alkali metal. It's always a plus one charge. Chloride is a minus one charge, so you only need one of each, K and Cl. That's it. It's a neutral then. A plus one and a minus one neutralize each other. Magnesium bromide. Magnesium is an alkaline earth. It's always a plus two. Bromine is a halogen. It's always a minus one. So you need two of the minus ones to balance the one of the two plus. Magnesium bromide. Calcium oxide. Calcium is a plus two charge. Oxygen or oxide is a minus two charge. So one of each is enough. So what would we name this one? Well, you look, where is strontium located? Strontium is an alkaline earth. It's a two plus charge. Bromine is a minus one charge. And we can also tell from the compound, if it's written correctly, SRBR2. This is a minus one, so that's a two minus. From these, that one has to be a two plus. Okay? And we know it is because of where it's located in the periodic table. Strontium bromide. All right. Type 2 compounds. Type 2 compounds occur between metals and uh, non-metals. But in this case, the metal has the ability to assume two or more different charges, depending on its the compound that it's located. Uh, the example here is iron. Iron is a transition metal. When it forms an ionic compound, it usually assumes either a plus two charge or a plus three charge. Now for many of these transition metals, they can have six, seven, eight, nine different possible charges, but they're usually two or three that are the most common. They're the only ones that you need to consider, really. Um, so, in order to satisfy this rule, cannot be ambiguous. If I were to write um, this and this, and say I put um, two here, or I could put three here, right? We don't know unless we know how to resolve the, the compound formula, what the charge on iron is. It could be a two or three. Well, in this case, we know that that's a minus one, so this has to be a plus two. And that's a minus one, so this has to be a plus three. Right? So from the formula, we can deduce the charge on the iron. Now, how do we name it? so that we can come back to that formula from the name. All right, so we use iron and then chloride. But the way we guarantee that the, this name contains the proper charge for the iron ion is we use Roman numerals. So that Roman numeral two says it's this compound right here. All right, and you should be able to go backwards and forwards. If you have that name, you can write that compound. <clears throat> All right, here's some examples. And most of those examples come from the transition metals. But there, there are a couple of them that 
um, are not in the transition metal region. They're actually over underneath. I say, from your perspective, it's this way. Underneath the nonmetals. Remember how the nonmetals are divided by this stair step, right? Nonmetals over here, metals over here. Well, the transition metals are over here. And this group in here, you have some uh, metals that can assume different charges. Uh, for example, tin. Tin is in the carbon group, right? It's underneath carbon. Tin can have a two plus charge or a plus four charge, most commonly. Um, these older names are just put in there for curiosity. Uh, when I was a student, we had to learn those things too. Like uh, Stannis is two plus and Stanic is four plus for tin. The problem with that naming system is it depends on which element it is, whether it's a two plus four plus or maybe it's a two, it's a two plus three plus for cobalt. Cobaltus and cobaltic, or uh, two and a four for lead, that's consistent. I'll talk about mercury in a minute. It's a weird one. There's another way to determine which ones have a charge and which ones have multiple charges and which ones have single charges. The periodic table that I give you in the review document, and that is available in useful information for uh, every test from now on, has within each element square in the periodic table, has a list of charges in the upper right-hand corner. Those charges, the first couple of them, refer to ionic compounds. Um, a word of warning, the non-metal values there, uh, usually pluses or minuses, may not be charges. They may signify an oxidation state, which is not a charge, right? And we haven't talked about that yet. So be careful when you use those. All right. So we use that Roman numeral to specify the charge. Right? And when you name the ion, uh, in, in the case of the first one in our list here, Fe3+, plus, that's iron 3. Or down to uh, Sn2+, plus is 10, 2. That's how you would name the ion. Oh, mercury. I said I was going to mention mercury. Mercury is an oddball. When mercury assumes a charge, it's always a 2 plus charge. So if we're going to have a mercury... Let's just write it out. If we're going to have a mercury two ion, there's only one atom with all the charge focused on that one atom. If we need a mercury one, and it's always a two plus charge, now we have to have two atoms of mercury. So that the two plus charge is spread over two atoms, that means that each one is a one plus charge. Okay, mercury, that's peculiar to mercury. It's the only one that does that. All right. So here are the rules that I've already given you for naming a type two compound. So, if you're confronted, if you're presented with uh, a name or a formula for a compound, and say you have a formula and you want to name it, how do you choose? Well, if it's got a metal in it, if it's got that cation, then it's either one of these, a one or a two. And then you have to decide what type of metal is it. Does it form a fixed charge? Or does it have possibility for multiple charges? And then if it has multiple charge possibility, you have to deduce the charge from the formula. Right. Uh, our example was, say, calcium oxide. 
Oxygen is a calcogen. It's always a two minus charge. So that means calcium, this one calcium has to be a two plus. That's a bad example. That's a type one carbonyl. Uh, how about, um, um, ah, how about this one? Fe2O3. Uh, okay. Oxygen is always two minus. So three times two minus is a six minus, correct? You've got to balance that with a six plus. But the six plus is spread over two atoms. So each one of those atoms has to be a three plus. All right. Okay. Let's see. We got some examples. Here we go. Copper, C U B R. Okay. You look at the periodic table and you look for its charges. You find that copper is a transition metal with two possibilities either a plus one or a plus two charge. Now, in the transition metals, remember, there are three that have fixed charges silver, zinc, and cadmium. The rest of them have multiple charges. So, this copper one bromide says that the charge on copper is a plus one. And bromine, or the bromide, is from the halogens, it's always a minus one. So we know that that's correctly written. FES. Sulfur comes from the uh, oxygen group. It's a minus two charge. So iron must be a two plus charge if, if there's only one iron and one sulfur together. Iron 2 sulfide is correct. PbO2. Oxygen is always a 2 minus charge. If you have two oxygens, that means you have a total of four minuses. That one lead must balance the four minuses with a four plus. So lead must be Roman numeral four. Lead four oxide. What's the name of this compound? CRO2. You have to know what CR means. CR is chromium. Oxygen is a calcogen with two minus charge. You have two of them, so that's a four minus. That means chromium has to be a four charge. Now, where does chromium come from? It is a transition metal. It does have the possibility for multiple charges. So we say chromium four oxide. All right. Oh, we got another one. Okay. What's the correct name of a compound that results from the most stable ion of sulfur? Okay. Sulfur, which is a two minus charge. It's an oxygen group, calcogen. Um, and a metal ion that contains 24 electrons. So we got... We got a metal here with 24 electrons. Well, if there's only one metal and it's got to balance that one, what's the charge on the metal? Charge on the metal is two plus. That means that metal has an excess of two positives. That means we need 26 protons, correct? So this has 26 protons. Look it up on the periodic table. It happens to be iron. There's the compound. Now, how do we name it? Well, it's got a two plus charge. So we say iron two sulfide. There it is. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, let's see if we get to 
Yeah, I think we've got type three compounds coming up. Okay, type three. Type three binary compound. We haven't yet discussed the compound formed from nonmetals. That's the type three compound. This is non and non. Now, what we're going to find out, and what we should know already, is that when two nonmetals form a compound, there are no ions produced. They can't produce ions. That only happens between metals and nonmetals. So, we, we're going to borrow from the naming convention of the type 1, 2 and uh, restrict it in some form or modify it, let's say, modify it for type 3s. So with these two nonmetals, we, we treat the first element in the compound as the metal and just name it. So for instance, if we have this compound, we should just say carbon. Okay. And then we use the naming convention for the anion for the second element. So this is oxide. Okay. But since these don't form ions, there's no way to balance a charge. So we actually have to say how many there are. This is one. We never say uh, the, we use the Greek prefixes. And I think that's on another slide, but I'll write them up here anyway. The Greek prefix to, to say how many of each. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. This is mono. This is di. So that would be dioxide. This is tri, tetra, penta, hexa, and these are followed by the roots. This is hepta, this is octa, this is nona, this is deca. There we go. Those are your prefixes that say how many of each you have. Carbon dioxide. We don't say monocarbon dioxide. <clears throat> if you only have one in the metal position, it's not a metal, but it's the metal position, then you just say the name. And that's how we name uh, binary, type three binary compounds. Right, there are your prefixes. I added a couple. Nona and Deca. Those are Greek. Those are derived from the Greek, and they mean exactly what they say. Examples. There's our carbon dioxide. How about SF6? Well, first thing you have to do is when you see a compound, say, what type is it? Is it metal, nonmetal, or nonmetal, nonmetal? These, you can tell, are non-metal, non-metal. So that means it has to be a type 3 compound. That's the only possibility. If there's a metal in the first position, then you go to two or three, I mean, uh, one or two, and then you break the tie with uh, either a fixed charge or a variable charge. So sulfur hexa is the prefix, the Greek prefix for six, hexafluoride. In this case, we have two nitrogens and four oxygens. So we do say dinitrogen tetroxide. Notice that when, when we have this tetra and the, the A and the O together, the A drops off. So it's only tetroxide, not tetraoxide. How about this one? What's SE? That's selenium. Right. Where do we find selenium? Well, it's in the oxygen group, and it's a non-metal. So we say selenium dioxide.
Okay. Um, if you like flow charts, decision charts, go ahead and use it. And this says exactly what I've told you before. Look, see if there's a metal in it. If there's no metal, then it's type three. If there's a metal, then it's either a one or a two. Now you need a tiebreaker, like right? fixed charge or variable charge. Um, okay. So I mentioned earlier that binary compounds have two components, the cation side, the anion side, or, or the, uh, <laughs> the mimic of a cation anion. Sometimes the cation or the anion can be a group of atoms with a single charge, a, a charge of some kind, let's see, not a single charge, but a charge of some value. And that group behaves as a single unit, right? And there's a whole list of them. Um, should be in uh, the review document. Let me check to be sure. Well, I know the, the polyatomic ions are in the extra credit for naming compounds. Here they go. So in your review document, that's available in Brightspace, you have the whole list of polyatomic ions. There's actually, these are all of them here. The left-hand side is sorted by alphabetical by the name, and the right-hand side is alphabetical by the formula. Right, so you have the same on either side, they're just sort of different. Um, so, these polyatomic ions behave as a single unit. All of them except one are anions. They're negatives. There is one positive. So most of them you're going to put in the second position, right? And that means they can either go with this type of compound or this type of compound because they are ions. They have to be paired with a metal or a cation, for instance. Now, the one cation in that polyatomic group is this one. That's ammonium. Okay. The rest of them are anions. These special names, that says you have to memorize them, but I've given you a list. So just become proficient using that list. If you do it enough, you're going to memorize them anyway. Here are some examples from that list. There's your ammonium, the very first one. When, when you put ammonium into the name, it goes into the cation position and that is the name. Uh, just like you name the element, you name the, the polyatomic ion, ammonium, and then follow it with the anion, whatever it happens to be. Ammonium chloride. Uh, ammonium, you could even substitute a, a negatively charged polyatomic. Ammonium phosphate, for instance. Notice that phosphate has a three minus charge. Now, all of these... Uh, polyatomics have fixed charges. There's only one charge available for, for each one of them. So this is ammonium. And if we put phosphate out here, we know that that is a PO4 3 minus. Okay. If we say ammonium phosphate, that is unambiguous. And to balance the charge, you need three of these. Now, that's peculiarity of polyatomic ions. You cannot break them up. You cannot change the subscript here. If you need three of these, you can't say N3H12. You have to do this. And use three of them. And there are a bunch in here. Um, you'll notice this acetate, right? You'll find that in vinegar. It's acetic acid. We haven't named acid yet, but we're coming to it. All right.
Some of them do form logical groups like chlorine and oxygen. And this, if you want to memorize them, this will help you do that. If you have chlorine and oxygen together and say chlorine and you have three oxygens and they're all minus one charge. This one is chlorate. You take away one oxygen. Uh, let me go back. Let me go the other direction. Take away one oxygen. This is chloride. Take away another oxygen. Now, we don't have a, a suffix that'll cover this uh, uh, option. So we need a prefix and a suffix. And we say hypo chloride. Underneath chloride. Hypo means underneath, right? Hypodermic needle, needle means under the skin. And then we have another one that goes, adds another oxygen here. This is per chloride. See, it, it follows a pattern. And you can do this with any of the halogens. You can substitute bromine in here. Then it would be bromate, bromide, hypobromide, perbromate. Or you can substitute iodine in here. So it would be iodate, iodite, hypoiodite, or per iodate. That helps you memorize them. Sometimes you start off with a polyatomic and we add a hydrogen to it. So if we have SO4, two minus, this is sulfate, and you add a hydrogen to it, the hydrogen comes in there with a plus one charge. Think of it that way. If it comes in with a plus one, it neutralizes one of those. Now you only have one minus. And the name of this one, and this is a polyatomic. These, this HSO4 minus is a single group that does not come apart when it reacts, usually. So this is just simply called hydrogen sulfate. Okay. There's some others. Um, I'll give you a chance to look at them uh, at your leisure. That's kind of small print. That's why I, I printed out a larger version. So in this case, name that compound. Well, the cation is ammonium. The anion is acetate. And they have fixed charges. So they fit right there. Type 1. Ammonium acetate. All right. Hydroxide is a polyatomic ion, OH minus. Sodium hydroxide. Sodium is a metal with a fixed charge, so it's a type one compound, sodium hydroxide. Everybody knows sodium hydroxide if they've ever, ever cleaned out a clogged drain. Right? Drano is sodium hydroxide, concentrated sodium hydroxide. Or liquid plumber is a solution, an aqueous solution of sodium hydroxide with a thickening agent so it won't splatter everywhere. Right? Nitrate, magnesium has a two plus charge. Nitrate only has a one min minus charge. So in order to balance the charge, we need two nitrates. That's why the parentheses. Now, if you go back the other direction, um, well, actually, if you're trying to name the compound, then you need to be able to, to recognize polyatomic ions. In O3, you wouldn't name it nitrogen trioxide. Right? Not in this context, because now it's functioning as a polyatomic ion. You need to recognize polyatomic ions, even if you don't know how to name them all. 
because if you can't recognize them, you won't know to look them up in the list. All right, different examples using the rules. Uh, naming compounds, let's see. How about the name of this one? Well, I erased it. ClO3, we recognize as a polyatomic ion. Uh, so many of the polyatomic ions have oxygen in them. So if you have three elements in a name, and one of them is oxygen, then suspect the polyatomic. And then look at it closer to see if it, if it fits the polyatomic uh, format. So potassium is the metal. ClO3 minus is the anion or the polyatomic ion that substitutes in that position. So it would be potassium chlorate would be the name. Okay. Examine the following table of formulas and names, which count compounds are named correctly. All right, so we, we're going to take those this list and see if we can find any that are uh, written cor incorrectly. How about the first one? Diphosphorus pentoxide. Is that named correctly? All right, look at the cation anion positions. Phosphorus, oxygen. Those are both nonmetals. This is a type 3 compound that must be specified how many atoms there are in each formula. Diphosphorus is correct. Pentoxide is also correct. So Roman numeral 1 is correct. ClO2, right? This is not in a compound, so it, it's not a polyatomic ion. This is a non-metal, non-metal. And it needs to be named correctly. Chlorine is, is correct. We start with chlorine. We don't say mono because it's a type 3 compound. Chlorine dioxide. Roman numeral 2 example is wrong. How about PBI4? Right? Is this a type 1 or type 2 or type 3? Well, it's not a type 3 because well, that's a metal. But what kind of metal is it? Is it a fixed charge or variable charge? Lead is a variable charge. So it's a type 2 compound. This is a, a 1 minus charge. So we have uh, 4 minuses. This has to be 4 plus. That means it should be lead 4 iodide, right? That way it's written is wrong. Roman numeral three is wrong. How about CUSO4? CUSO4. One, two, three elements. One of them is an oxygen. We've probably got a polyatomic. And polyatomic is here. That's a two minus charge. That means this has to be a two plus charge because there's only one of them. So it should be copper two sulfate. That's wrong. The only correct one in this group is Roman numeral one. All right. That's the type of practice you need to become proficient with these naming conventions. All right, so I'm gonna make room for acids now. Let me see how much time I got. It's 10 o'clock already. Um, okay, we're good till 11. Acids. The naming conventions for acids is an attempt by IUPAC to incorporate naming conventions from antiquity. Like 
Um, alchemists have known of several mineral acids for centuries, and they chose names for them. So what we've had to do is to um, formulate rules that accommodate older names and give some structure to naming future acids. So this is what we've come up with. First of all, recognize an acid. This example is HCl. All right, if we name this by our uh, earlier convention, we consider hydrogen and chloride as nonmetals and say hydrogen. Actually, we wouldn't say even hydrogen. We do we treat hydrogen as a positive ion, treat it as a metal. So this would be hydrogen chloride. Okay. And if it's pure in its gaseous form, that's it. It's hydrogen chloride. But if you dissolve it in water, and we use this suffix, AQ, this designator, AQ is aqueous. If we put HCl in water, now the name changes, and we have to name it as an acid. Well, we have to say, well, is it an acid first? And yes, when we put it in water, it starts with that hydrogen. And that hydrogen is the, the part of the molecule that makes it an acid. Okay. Um, so once we've established that it's an acid, it's an aqueous solution, and we know what it's named if it's not in aqueous solution, because that's that's going to be useful. Then what we have to ask ourselves is, is there oxygen in the name? Is there oxygen anywhere? There's no oxygen there. So in this case, if we're going to name it as an acid, we always start with hydro. Okay. Then we take the anion part of the name, and IDE becomes IC. I becomes IC. So we say chloric acid. So with no oxygen and hydrogen chloride as the non-acid name, IDE becomes IC, and this is hydrochloric acid. HCl is hydrochloric acid. How about this one? This one is a polyatomic, HCN. Now, what would its name be if it were not dissolved in water? Well, this would be hydrogen, and that polyatomic is cyanide. Okay, but we're going to put it in water. Now, we have no oxygen, so we start with hydro. Hydro, and I becomes ic, cyanic acid, hydrocyanic acid. H2S would be hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide then has no oxygen in it, so we'd start the name with hydro, and then S, rather than sulfic, that just doesn't sound right, we say we expand it to sulfuric, sulfuric acid. Hydrosulfuric acid is H2S. And here are several others. HF is hydrofluoric acid. Let's see, HBr, hydrobromic. HI, hydroiodic acid. What if the name contains oxygen? Well, if the name has oxygen in it, then we don't say hydro. We drop the hydro part. 
If the anion has an oxygen in it, we drop the hydro part and we go straight to the anion part of the name. So let's take this one. H2SO4. If this were pure and not dissolved in water, this would be hydrogen sulfate. So in that case, we go straight to this part of the name as an acid. And this becomes sulfuric acid. That's it. You start with the anion. Notice that if it's got oxygen in the name, uh, I can't think of a single example where there's not a polyatomic ion. It has to be a polyatomic ion. So HNO3 dissolved in water is nitric acid. Why? Because that group is nitrate. Eights become X. Okay. Here's the uh, acetate polyatomic that I mentioned earlier. Acetate ion for this. Let's see. Let's just erase those. So if we start with the acetate. Put it in water. If this is acetate, then we have eight becomes it, acetic acid. Right. Five percent acetic acid is vinegar. I'll also point one other thing out. Notice that there's a hydrogen here, and there are hydrogens there also. This is known as the acidic hydrogen, the one that comes first. These are non-acidic. What that means is when you put it in aqueous solution, this is the one that leaves the molecule and is responsible for the sour taste, the acidic nature of the solution. These hydrogens are locked in place. They do not dissociate. That's why they're written separately over here. <clears throat> Okay. Well, eights become X, right? Eight becomes Ick. How about eight? Eight becomes us, right? So we have, instead of HNO3, we have HNO2. That is nitrite. So nitrite becomes nitrous acid. There it is. Sulfate is SO4, sulfite is SO3. So it becomes so, uh, H2SO3 then is sulfurous acid. And we mentioned the uh, chlorite, the chlorate, chlorite, the hypochlorite, and the perchlorate. Then the uh, ite, that ClO2, when we make it an acid, the chlorite becomes an us, it's a chlorous acid. Okay. These are several um, oxygen-containing acids. Uh, we mentioned all but the phosphoric acid, H3PO4. PO4 is phosphate. So eight becomes ick. There's an oxygen. So there's no mention of hydro. It's just phosphoric acid. And there's your decision chart if you are so inclined. So how about naming these? Correctly or incorrectly.
Let's see. Now we got a mixture of everything supposedly derived from all of the rules that we covered so far. How about KNO3? Right? Type one, type two, type three. Well, it's a metal non-metal. It's a metal and a non-metal analog and on a, a polyatomic ion that's occupying this position. So that metal is fixed charge. It's a type one compound. So we only have to say potassium nitrate. That's the name of this part of the molecule, potassium nitrate then. How about TiO2? Well, where does titanium come from? Titanium is a transition metal and it has the possibility for variable charge. So we got to figure out what is the charge on titanium, metal, non-metal. This is a two minus charge. That means four minus total. This is four plus. This should be titanium four oxide. Right there. That one given is wrong. How about SNOH4? Hydroxyl is a polyatomic with a minus one charge. Four times a minus one is four minus. That means this has to be four plus. So this is 10, four hydroxide. Right? Is that one correct? Yes. How about this one? PBR5. Type 1, type 2, type 3. Both nonmetals. This is a type 3 compound. So we have to say how many there are. But there's only one phosphorus. So we just write phosphorus. And there are five bromides. Five is penta. Okay. That one is correct. How about H2SO3? This is an acid, right? Its lead off element is hydrogen. So if we were to name it non aqueous, it would be hydrogen. Sulfite. Notice? Not sulfate, sulfite. Ites become uses. There's an oxygen here. We don't say hydro. So we say sulfite becomes sulfurous acid. We left out the aqueous part, but we're naming it as an acid anyway. All right. The only one that's wrong is... B, titanium oxide, titanium four oxide. All right. Sodium hydroxide, that's what it looks like. Why? Because it's a type one compound with a polyatomic ion. Sodium can only have one charge, and hydroxide is always minus one. So one sodium, one hydroxide, that's all you need. Potassium carbonate. Potassium makes it a type one compound. It's a metal with a fixed charge. So potassium K, carbonate. What's carbonate? Carbonate, this is a plus one. Carbonate is a two minus charge. So if we write it correctly, we need two potassiums. How about sulfuric acid? Well, that was easy. X were derived from eight sulfate, SO4, two minus, and then we need enough hydrogens here to balance it. 
with their plus one. That would be sulfuric acid. Dinitrogen pentoxide. We know we've got nitrogen. We know we've got oxygen. And we know that they're both nonmetals. And the giveaway is the prefixes. Dinitrogen pentoxide. How about cobalt-3 nitrate? Well, we know we have cobalt. And the Roman numeral tells us that it's a multiple charge. It's a type 2 compound. Plus, we know that cobalt comes from the region of the periodic table where multiple charges are possible. This is a 3 plus charge. And then we have nitrate attached to it with a minus 1 charge. So that means we need three of those. So that's CO, big C, little o, nitrate taken three times. Okay. All right. We've got time to do a little detective work here. A compound has a formula XCl3. Okay, X stands first, any element, XCl3. X could represent a metal or non-metal. What could the name of this compound be? Oh, well, we have examples. So that's multiple choice. Oops. <laughs> well, of our choices, let's see. Let's, let's cross out the metals first. How about C, 10,4 chloride? 10,4 chloride would be like that. So that's not it. How about magnesium chloride? Magnesium chloride would be that because you'd have minus one times two is minus two and that's a plus two. So C and D, we can throw them out. So let's look at the type three possibilities. Carbon monochloride. Well, in the first place, that doesn't exist, but it's not the valid name. Uh, it's not the valid formula for that. So the other possibility is phosphorus trichloride. So P, Cl3, yeah, that works. Okay, here's the last possibility for naming. Up to this point, we've just named compounds, and there's been nothing attached to them. As a practical matter, though, sometimes um, with these um, ionic compounds, right, this doesn't apply to type 3 compounds. This is only type 1s and type 2s. These ionic compounds, when, when we precipitate them from aqueous solution and we dry them down, dry the solid, and we can even heat it at 105 degrees Celsius, which would drive off, uh, which would boil all the water, correct? 100 degrees is the boiling point of water. So 105 degrees um, heating this compound should remove all the water, right? So we do that. And we get a compound that uh, our, our sample weighs a certain amount. Uh, but then we want to be sure that doesn't have any other any more water attached to it. So we stick it in the oven at 200 degrees because we know that the compound will not decompose or it won't melt at 200, but that's enough to drive off any extra water. So we stick it in the oven for several hours at 200 degrees Celsius, and what do you know? It loses weight. So we had some water attached to the compound that was not driven off at 105 degrees. This is called water of hydration. Examples. Right? Copper 2 sulfate can have five, five water molecules for every one copper sulfate formula unit. So if you have one 
of these units, you can have five waters attached to it. And that's the way we write it. We put a dot in the middle of a line, not down where the period is, but in the middle of a line, and then how many waters are associated. So how do we name this? Well, you name it like that, though, right there. This is two minus, this has to be two plus. So we can say copper, oops. Yeah, we say copper. Ah. Copper two sulfate. And then we use the Greek prefixes to say how many waters there are. These are five. So we say penta. And the Greek name for water is hydrate. So this compound would be copper sulfate pentahydrate. Okay, that's the way we name compounds with waters of hydration. Zinc sulfate is another example. Okay, if we have this one, And zinc of one. If we put zinc two sulfate in there, it would be redundant. We'd be putting information in there that we already know. So we only say zinc sulfate. And it it can be associated with seven water. So we say hepta hydrate. All right. So uh, that's probably enough for naming. I think, yeah, that's that's the it for, for naming compounds. Stop the share. So you got lots of practice that's uh, built into the review document. Plus you have the uh, 50 ways to name your compound, which is uh, a way to earn some extra credit and still get practice naming compounds. Uh, and then, of course, you have your periodic table that you, that you uh, fill out. And those have places uh, in the assignment. And you go into uh, Module 2. This is for Exam 2. Go into Module 2, and you'll find extra credits identified. And when you, when you go inside those individual folders and you find the document that you need to print out and fill out, then you'll also find on that same page a place to submit them. Right, so upload. That's where you upload your, your product. And um, it's probably the 50 ways to name your compound is set up as a, as a uh, uh, form, a PDF form. So you can fill those out in your computer. But in order to do the subscripts properly, you need your computer needs to, uh, and your program, your uh, Acrobat reader needs to recognize this keystroke. Control E. Control E will open the editor in the form for the Acrobat reader, and that way you'll be able to to subscript, because if you write something like this. Is wrong, right? See, carbon dioxide is like this. That goes for if, if you want to do it handwritten, you better pay attention to that also because this is extra credit. And if you don't get it right, you don't get the extra credit. <clears throat> okay. Um, I don't have anything else today. And today was going to be a, uh, a buffer day in case chapter four ran long. But I got finished with chapter four last Thursday, so I did chapter five today. And now um, Thursday becomes a buffer day.
So what I'll do is I'll just come in here and um, set up like usual. And in fact, um, what I'll do is I'll pull out the review document and start working review problems. That way we'll have both uh, Thursday and next Tuesday. Let's see, next Tuesday. Yeah, that'll give us this Thursday and next Tuesday to do reviews for chapters four and five. And then the following Thursday will be the exam and you will have extra time to do review. Okay, that's all I have for today.